Well, thank you very much, and thank you for this extremely Sorry. kind introduction. It was probably the nicest introduction I've ever gotten for any talk. Um, and I'm also extremely privileged to be here among all these unbelievable fellows, and I'm very, very flattered to be having been selected as a Radcliffe Fellow. When I found out that I got this fellowship, I was actually somewhere in rural Vietnam about a year ago on a public bus with spotty internet, and I got this email, and it didn't open for about seven minutes, and when it finally opened, I started to scream, and all these Vietnamese people on the public bus looked at me like, these foreigners are so weird. <laughs> so anyway, it's, uh, it's been great to be here, and uh, I hope I can share with you a little bit of what I do uh, this afternoon, so thank you very much for being here today. I want to also thank Professor Gallus for setting up my topic last week in last week's lecture, um, where he actually showed you this picture, which uh, becomes very handy to me today. So because he already gave you an introduction into genetics and transcription and translation and what happens very basically with our DNA as it is transcribed into RNA and translated into the proteins that make us alive and makes our body function such as hormones and other uh, proteins. Professor Gallus also showed you this picture. And as he was explaining um, his work and the work he does with RNA and telling you, and RNA polymerase, and telling you that uh, all the mechanisms that I showed you before work in all different cell types the same, set me up for my journey today I want to go down a different path. I want to ask the questions, what makes these cells different, given that they do have all the same DNA and all the same uh, transcription and translation of processes? How come, then, they are different? And um, they all arise, of course, from the same stem cells with the same genetic information. And remember, each one of us, as we are sitting here, is a former stem cell. <laughs> so um, the answer to the question why we have different cells, one is a muscle cell and one is a blood cell and one is a kidney cell, is that while every cell has the same potential due to their genetics, potential in expression and forming proteins, every cell activates different genes. So your DNA is basically little compartments, which are the, the genes that then can be translated into different proteins. And not every cell reads the entire genome. In fact, no cell reads the entire genome. Every cell decides which of the genes are necessary to produce the cell, the, the protein that makes the cell the cell and its particular function. Now, I'm interested in the mechanism that makes this possible, and that is basically epigenetics. So what is epigenetics? Epigenetics is a mechanism that sh shuts on and off these genes in the different cell types. And uh, epigenetics uses three different mechanisms to do this. One is DNA methylation, which is possibly the best known epigenetic mechanism which is essentially just adding something, an adduct, onto the DNA. And that also explains the name epigenetics, epi meaning above, on top of the DNA, an additional layer of information on the DNA that tells the DNA whether it's active or passive. And in addition to this DNA methylation, which is basically adding methylation groups to certain parts of the DNA, depending on whether you want to silence it by adding a methyl group or activating it by not uh, adding this blockade. In addition, there's also the chromatin structure of your DNA, uh, which basically means you all know that the DNA is an incredibly long uh, molecule, but it has to fit into this unbelievably tiny cell, so it's curled up, okay? And this curling up, if it's really dense, this messenger RNA, Professor Gallus told you about last week, cannot get there and do the transcription and then you know, go on to do the translation and the protein. So 
depending on how it's curled up, we call this the chromatin structure, there is, it is possible to read these genes or not. And then also curling them around the histone uh, <laughs> molecules in your cell also allows potentially whether these genes are going to be read or not. The third mechanism was only later added to the understanding of epigenetics, and that is microRNAs. MicroRNAs also contribute to being able to read this information on the DNA. So what the microRNA does is it potentially uh, binds to messenger RNA and therefore blocks the translation process so the protein is not created. Um, so we have DNA methylation, chromatin and histone modification, and microRNAs as the, th the three fundamental uh, functions in epigenetics. By far the best studies is DNA methylation, and most of what I'm going to talk about today is about DNA methylation. DNA methylation is the most stable mechanism. First of all, um, it is more like the long-term mechanism, whereas the chromatin structure can change very quickly. Um, and the microRNAs can too. The other thing is that it is just easier to study because it is stable in samples that we all have in our refrigerators or freezers. So that's why a lot more insights have been um, accomplished in the context of DNA methylation. And this is just a simple graph on how DNA methylation works. Um, so if you have methylated, which methylation, which is... <coughs> signified here by the solid lollipops uh, in certain regions of your DNA, then the gene expression is repressed and your gene is not expressed and not translated into a protein. But if you don't have this methylation, if your DNA area is unmethylated, then you have expression and the gene is basically used in that cell. So now we have genetics and epigenetics. So how do they relate? So we have the genetics, the DNA, and for those of you who have done 23andMe, you get a result about your genetics, but there's very little you can do about it. You have your genes, and that's it. Epigenetics is much more dynamic. It does enable the genetics to be used or to be silenced with the three mechanisms that I just told you about. So epigenetics is something much more dynamic and also opens up new opportunities for us for prevention, disease prevention, as I'm going to uh, allude to, and also how we deal as a result and response of the environment we are exposed to. Let me give you a few examples to illustrate the importance of epigenetics. Butterfly <laughs> development. Three different developmental stages, same genome, different what we call phenotype. It looks different, okay? And this is enabled by epigenetics. Another example from the animal world, the so-called jumping ant. Um, just like the bees, they have a queen and worker ants. The queen is large, only reproduces, and has low brain function. Don't need much brain for reproduction. Whereas the worker ants have to be smart because they keep the whole thing going, maintaining the colony, but they do not reproduce. Now, what happens when the queen bee, uh, excuse me, the queen ant, that is, dies? So if the queen dies, the workers fight for the throne. And the winner upregulates some genes, in particular telomerase and uh, so T1, which are longevity genes, because the queen has about 10 times the lifespan of the worker ants. Now, what does that tell you? All these ants have the same genome, but they are able to up or down regulate some of their genes depending on the needs. And so a, a worker can become queen just by upregulating some genes and also down-regulating, again, brain function, up-regulating reproductive function. So these are some of the wonders of the animal world, all epigenetic phenomena. And finally, the well-known queen, queen bee from the honeybees. Um, also here we have queen bee and worker bees, but here it's a little bit different because it depends on the diet now, which is very interesting. 
Um, they all have the same genome again, but in the larva stage, it depends what food you get. Do you get the royal jelly or the worker jelly? And if you get the royal jelly, you become a queen. But if you, become, if you get the worker jelly, you become a worker. Okay? Again, the queen, bigger, much longer lifespan, only reproduces, not much brain function. Okay? Very similar to the ants. All of this do, do the, to the effect, due to the effect of the diet. And a very different example now, um, you may have noticed that it's become pretty quiet in the area of cloning. You know, there was a lot of talk about cloning some time ago, and Dolly the sheep was a little clone. Um, and then Dolly didn't make it because Dolly died prematurely. So not much has happened since in cloning due to the fact that the cloning researchers realized that there was one thing that they couldn't accomplish. While they could faithfully copy the genome, they were unable to copy the epigenome. It is due to the failure of faithfully copy the epigenome that we cannot clone, at least so far. So epigenetics has moved much into the public eye, as you can see here, why your DNA isn't your destiny, the new science of epigenetics reveals how the choices you make can change your genes and those of your kids. And I will come back to that in a minute. But it has become a, sort of a more common, of common interest area to think about epigenetics and not only about genetics. Now, why is that? Because we are, with our epigenome, responding to the environment. What we eat can potentially influence our epigenome, the histone modification, the DNA methylation, the microRNAs. And that is in fundamental difference to genetics. Genetics doesn't change unless you have a mutation, which happens very rarely. Epigenetics changes as a result of the environment we live in. Not only what we eat, but many other things. Um, whether you smoke is one of the most potential challenges to your epigenome. Smokers have a substantially altered epigenome. Other things, whether it's exercise, taking drugs, social interactions, uh, air pollution, um, viruses or the microbiome, all of those are influencing our epigenome. Why is that so important? Because an aberrant epigenome predisposes you for disease, uh, to disease. And many diseases have been associated with a malfunctioning epigenome. Most uh, well-known and best studied cancer, but it is becoming apparent that many other diseases are associated with a malfunctioning epigenome. So given that we have this plasticity to adjust our epigenome to the environment, and given that the epigenome uh, is associated with disease uh, uh, probability, I think it is very important to understand the epigenome as well as we could. Now, let's go back to the basics. Um, to understand epigenetics, we have to understand how it works. And I just went to the internet and I put in epigenetics and I looked up the first definition that came up. And this is what came up. The term epigenetics refers to the heritable change in gene expression that does not involve changes in the underlying DNA sequence. <coughs> Now, the word heritable here is extremely important because it has led to a lot of confusion. This definition is not correct. It's not incorrect, but it's so imprecise that it is confusing. So the definition should say the mitotically heritable variation, and mitotically means cell division. So what I'm trying to say is that Epigenetics, when it is connected with the word heritable, means from one cell to the next in your body. The muscle cell wants to stay a muscle cell. And as the cells in the muscle cells divide, the epigenome stays the same. 
it is faithfully reproduced within the muscle cell because the muscle cell is not want to become the kidney cells. Of course, the stem cell researchers want the muscle cell to become a kidney cell, but that's a different topic. For your body to function properly, your muscle cell has to stay the muscle cell. And that's where the word heritable is justified. But carry that outside, lose the word mitotic. People think of heritable from one generation to the next, mother to the child, and that is what I'm interested in. Is that actually the case, that we are inheriting an aberrant epigenome that resulted from us smoking to our children or not? When I said to some people I was going to give the talk, is epigenetics heritable? They said to me, what's the question? Of course it is, isn't it? <laughs> that is because people think of heritable from one generation to the next. So the, con the field of epigenetics within and, and outside is completely confused by this word because it is never used or rarely used precisely. Whenever I go to a conference and people use this word, I get up and I say, mitotically, yes, because people forget to insert this word. Now, when is our epigenome set? Our ep epigenome is determined very early on, which makes sense because if the muscle cell needs to know early that it is a muscle cell and the kidney cell needs to know early that it is a kidney cell. So the epigenetic code is set in the embryo around the stage of the blastocyte. Now you are sort of a, you know, a little advanced stem cell. Um, but these cells that are undifferentiated, meaning they don't know their destiny and their function yet, they need to learn what they're going to be. At that time, the epigenome kicks in, is developed. Makes sense. So in utero, okay? Now, interestingly, and then, what, so what you see on this graph is actually the male and the female germline. So you inherit one gene from dad and one gene from mom. The blue one is the one you get from dad, and the red one is the one you get from your mother. And here you have low methylation and high methylation. And as you can see here, in this embryonic stage, your initially unmethylated genes, some of them will become methylated. And depending on what the cell is going to be, the certain parts of the DNA will be methylated or not. Now, what's interesting is what happens before this. So here, the male and female germline come together during the fertilization process. But in the actual sperm cell and oocyte, as you can see here, there is what we call a round of re- and demethylation. So what that means is your entire methylation is completely wiped out. Okay, then you establish another round of methylation. And after fertilization, being another complete wipeout of the DNA methylation. So Mother Nature makes you go through two cycles of completely wiping out your epigenetic memory. There must be a reason for that. Double insurance by evolution that you're not inheriting epigenetics information from mom or pop, okay? That's how I would interpret what's going on here, okay? Why otherwise would there be a double wipeout? So evolution, as I see it, does not plan for a transgenerational inheritance of the epigenome. So you would not suffer from the fact that mom has smoked or grandmom has smoked. But the record is set straight and you have a new start. So if it is there, if transgenerational inheritance of the epigenetic information happens, it would require that the epigenetic information is not completely wiped out. So incomplete erasure of these epigenetic marks. That would be required for transgenerational inheritance of the epigenome, if it then exists. So if it does exist, the other question is, is it permissive 
So is it sort of planned for that not everything is wiped out? Or is it an error? Is it a mistake? OK. That's big questions, and I'm not claiming to have the answers. But I'm going to show you some other data that we have. This is actually a very famous experiment. So this is an experiment that caused a lot of, uh, a lot of news articles. So we have a, what we call an agouti mouse. That's a certain subtype of mouse. And you can see that the agouti mouse is, has a, a light color, coat color, and it's a fat mouse. So depending on your, what you feed this mouse during pregnancy, so mother being pregnant, the mother may have different distribution of offspring. So this is two potential examples of offspring. If you feed the mother during pregnancy a diet that is very rich in methyl donors, and you may remember DNA methylation, the methyl groups going on the DNA. So you must have these methyl groups to go on the DNA. And they come from somewhere. And diet, in particular folic acid, methionine, cytosine, they provide these methyl groups with your diet. Now, if you have lots of them, you can use them, and they can go on your DNA. So this mother was fed a lot of these methyl donors. And then she had offspring that had very few representatives of the fat agouti trade with a light uh, fur color, whereas more offspring with brown color. If she was fed a regular diet, low in methyl donors, she had more of the agouti uh, offspring. So what happened here? Well, lots of uh, methyl groups, like the mother that has lots of the brown agouti offspring, silences the agouti gene. Methylation, silencing. Agouti yellow cannot be expressed. Okay. Now, hypomethylation, meaning no block blockage of the agouti. Agouti is expressed more of the yellow ones. So here is the distribution of the two. So this was a revolutionary experiment because it showed it does matter what the mother eats for the phenotype of the offspring. Plus, it was shown it's actually epigenetic. Okay, it's a methylation effect. Okay. Now, my question to you is that is now, is this transgenerational inheritance of epigenetics or not? Yes or no? Is it? Is it not? Well, I would say no. What it is, is simply intrauterine exposure. These mice were in utero exposed to whatever the mother eats. And as a result, it changed the epigenome of the offspring. We don't know anything about the epigenome of the mother. Okay? It changed the epigenome of the offspring. I mean, I'm not saying it is not completely impossible there is gen transgenerational inheritance. But my primary guess is it's a simple intrauterine exposure to diet of the mother that changed the epigenome of the child. And there's probably no inheritance going on here. OK? So the induced DNA methylation is a result of the maternal diet. OK, let's talk about some other examples. Identical twins. Epidemiologists love identical twins to study, in particular those who are discordant for disease later in life. Why, if the two, the two have identical genome, why does one of them develop cancer and the other not? Very interesting to study identical twins because genetics cannot be the explanation. Now, can it be epigenetics? Well, I think it could be a variety of things. First of all, it starts in utero. Oftentimes, identical 
twins have very different birth weight because they have di very different room. So one has better room to grow, the other one's very small. So already in utero, the conditions are different. And birth weight is a very good predictor of chronic disease risk 60, 70 years later. So that's one thing. The other thing is all these lifestyle factors that happen between birth and adulthood, of course, could contribute. And if, if these twins are reared apart, they are even more different. Nevertheless, um, it is important to note that identical twins, as they are born, they have a very similar epigenetic profile. But as they grow older, this epigenetic profile grows apart. Okay. So they develop further and further apart in their epigenetic profile. So there could, be some, there could be some epigenetic mechanism in these disease discordant of the identical twins. Again, is that transgenerational inheritance? Probably not. OK. There is a whole field of research that's called developmental origins of health and disease. And that basically talks about the intrauterine pre, uh, reprogramming of propensity to disease. So what you have here is during a critical period of development, you have a transient environmental stimulus. And a very good example of this is much studied famines. There are natural and less natural famines that occurred throughout the world and that have led to malnutrition of the mother, which is a transient environmental stimulus. But the offspring has been shown to have permanent long-term damage, ranging from obesity to psychiatric diseases and other chronic diseases. Again, people have talked about what are the mechanisms for these findings. And we are still talking about this because we still haven't understood what the mechanisms are. One prime candidate is epigenetics. And it, it could very well be epigenetics, but it may not be, again, transgenerational inheritance, but simply intrauterine exposures that may have changed the epigenetic of the offspring. So I think we really have to differentiate between the intrauterine exposure versus the transgenerational inheritance. And there is unbelievable confusion about that in the scientific community. So I, I'm going to show you three scenarios. One scenario is you have an intrauterine exposure to a stressor due to whatever happens to you in utero, behavior of the mother or something else, that leads via a mechanism that we don't understand well to a particular phenotype or disease. The other scenario is that the same exposure indeed does lead to an epigenetic modification, like in the agouti mouse, that then changes the phenotype, like the light fur color. Now, what I'm interested in figuring out is the transgenerational inheritance. That would start with an epigenetic modification that would then be inherited to the next or uh, next after next generation, and then cause a difference in phenotype. And this epigenetic modification is probably the result of some exposure that we undergo. So these are different scenarios that we have to distinguish between, but they are completely confused in the scientific literature. OK, which scenario of the three I just showed you is this? Grandmother smokes obesity in the grandchild. We find this in epidemiologic studies. Is this transgenerational inheritance necessarily? Well, remember I added a generation now. It's not mom, it's grandma. I added a generation. The grandma lives at home. I'm sorry? The grandma lives at home. Yes, yes, OK. I should have been more concrete in saying grandmother smokes during pregnancy with daughter. And granddaughter has obesity. But also the, the eggs that, were, that the child is going to come out of were all developed while... You got it. So thank you. What happens is grandmother smokes. 
So that's the first generation. Second generation is the fetus. But the fetus already carries the reproductive cells for the grandchild. So you already damage the reproductive cells for the third generation. So even with three generations, we cannot prove transgenerational inheritance because it can still be intrauterine exposure. So this is only true for females, though. For male germline, we really only need two generations because, as you know, sperms produce newly all the time. Okay. Um, so intrauterine exposure, intrauterine exposure for, uh, along the female germline can reach three generations. For the male germline can reach two. To prove transgenerational inheritance, you would need four generations along the female germline and three along the male germline. And I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying this could not be transgenerational inheritance along this line. I'm just saying to prove that it is, you need this. This is very hard to get. When you do this in humans, it would certainly expand, ex, you know, extend the, uh, exceed the lifetime of one researcher. So to have to do a study like this is very difficult to do. In humans, you can do it potentially in mice. Okay, so. The question comes back to, is there incomplete erasure of the epigenome? I looked a little bit into the literature. I'm, to, I'm just going to give you three quick examples from what's published in the literature. You can already see transgeneration is in the, in the headline here of this paper. Um, epigenetic information can be inherited through the mammalian germline and represents a plausible transgenerational carrier of environmental information. So they are out to prove the transgenerational inheritance of epigenetics. What do they do? Well, they exposed the paternal animal here to a low protein diet, and then they found in the next generation that there was a difference in DNA methylation. Is there anything transgenerational? Not in the sense we just established it. There's absolutely no proof here for transgenerational inheritance. It's pure intrauterine exposure. Yet these authors conclude these results in conjunction with recent human epidemiological data indicate that parental diet can affect cholesterol and lipid metabolism in offspring and define a model system to study environmental reprogramming of the heritable epigenome. There's no heritable epigenome here, nothing whatsoever. Next paper. This paper cost a lot of attention. Um, so what the investigators here did is they used, basically, they used a model of associating a certain smell with trauma and looked whether that was, a, also they could find this in the next generation. So if they expose the next generation to the same smell, were these, were they, did they express fear? Okay. So um, uh, they did these experiments. Uh, in F1, they exposed basically the sperm. They did an IVF conception. But they did absolutely no epigenetic experiments whatsoever in this paper. But they concluded that these transgenerational effects are inherited by a parental gametes. Our, uh, gametes. our findings provide a framework for addressing how environmental information may be inherited transgenerationally at behavioral, neuroanatomical, and epigenetic levels. They did absolutely no epigenetics. Okay. So this happens all the time. Um, and there is just a, a third example where they did exactly the same thing. Epigenetic germline inheritance is in the title. They did an experiment. There was no epigenetics done at all, yet epigenetics is in the title. At this point, I got so annoyed, I wrote a letter to the editor. After all, this is Nature Genetics, which is like the paper everybody wants to publish in. And I said, like, you know, what, what is it with you editors? Okay. <laughs> and they say, we are not interested. Okay? Basically, you publish your paper better if it has epigenetics in the title, as, as we know. 
Okay, this is how you get your grants, your tenure, and uh, your papers published. Okay. So far, so good. We haven't found anything that is transgenerationally inherited. Now I'm going to give you the one example where I'm convinced that there is transgenerational inheritance, which is genomic imprinting. Let me introduce you to genomic imprinting. We have some interesting subgroup of genes, very few, that do not follow their normal pattern. Normally, you get mom's allele, pop's allele, and you express them both or you silence them both. They both do the same thing, okay? Now, the imprinted genes are a little different because only one allele is expressed, either the father's or the mother's. The best known imprinted gene is IGF-2. IGF-2 is the most important intrauterine growth gene. It is very important for the growth of the fetus, makes the fetus big or not. What's, Im what's important about these imprinted genes is that they are faithfully always expressed from the same allele. So IGF-2, for example, is only expressed from the paternal chromosome, from the paternal allele, never from the mothers. And that is generation after generation after generation after generation. Okay? And um, you can ask, and this is another picture showing you more of the mechanisms. Um, you, can, you may ask, why do we have genomic imprinting? Well, there is the Haig hypothesis, and I'm very honored that Professor Haig actually came himself. If I had a hypothesis named after me, I would probably rest and enjoy. <laughs> but he, he's so prolific that, you know, he prints out his papers for me, and he, he writes a new paper every day. It's unbelievable. Anyway, so Professor Haig came up with the following reason for why genomic imprinting exists, and, and I'm very impressed by the theory that he came up with because I think it makes a lot of sense. Remember in, in, intrauterine growth, and many of the imprinted genes are actually responsible for intrauterine growth. That means growth, good for the baby, good for the survival of the baby. The father, of course, has one sole interest in reproduction, passing on his genome. The father doesn't know whether he's going to get another chance, so he's going to put all his eggs in one basket and make that baby big. Okay? The mother, of course, knows she can have as, much as, as many as she wants any time. Just go around the corner, you get another one. <laughs> Right? So she probably has 18 others at home to take care of, so she needs to balance the survival of the, that one child versus her own survival to take care of the 18 others. And she can have, you know, another 18 if she wants. So they have different interests, okay? So there is a conflict. All of this very elegantly explained by Professor Haig and his work. Um, there is this conflict where the mother has a very different interest than the father. In this evolutionary conflict, the father doesn't really care about the mother. The father cares about the genome. He doesn't care whether the mother dies. So the bigger the better. So the mother shuts off the growth genes, the father shuts them on. And that is true for all these intrauterine growth genes. The father shuts them all on, not only on IGF-2, but there are others, whereas the mother shuts them all off. And that's the imprinted genes. But what's fascinating, of course, fascinating in terms of ev an evolutionary hypothesis, what's, what's fascinating besides why do we have this is that this parent of origin, the mother shutting them off, the father turning them on for many of these imprinted genes, not all, but many, is faithfully passed from one to the next generation and maintained. So this is the one example that I would accept as transgenerational inheritance of epigenetic information. We do not well understand how it works, though. 
And that's something that I'm extremely interested in. And Professor Haig has some thoughts on this. I had some thoughts. We discussed this the other day. Um, but I think the jury is not out how this works. So there must be something that, um, some mechanisms that obviously makes this possible. And to come back to our graph, the one thing I did not explain to you previously is the black line. The black line are the imprinted genes. And what you can see here is that imprinting only has one cycle of demethylation, and it's not, it's not wiped out again after fertilization. That already means something in the context of evolution, in that the imprinted genes seem to escape some of this D and remethylation cycle. So in conclusion, we have intrauterine exposures that can affect our phenotype many decades later. These intrauterine exposures can impact on the epigenome of the fetus, whether epigenetics is one of the mechanisms underlying these intrauterine exposures and how they relate to phenotype or disease later in life remains to be established. But we need to distinguish between epigenetic changes as a consequence of intrauterine exposures and transgenerational inheritance of epigenetic marks, which is something totally different. So on the transgenerational epigenetic inheritance, I think there is insufficient evidence from human studies to suggest that there is such thing, except for the imprinting. But on all the other examples that I've shown you, I'm not saying it's not there. I'm saying we don't have evidence. The data from animal studies is very limited. Most of the studies are interpreted incorrectly because there is confusion, confusion about much of the terminology. And to prove it, we need four generations down the female and three generations down the, the male line, which is very, very hard to do in humans. And even in animals, it seems nobody seems to bother to do this, uh, but still claim that they have transgenerational inheritance. So the exception is the parent of origin mechanism of imprinting, which I would completely subscribe to as transgenerational inheritance of epigenetic information, but we do not well understand how this actually works. There must be some memory that always tells the paternal allele to be turned on and the maternal allele to be shut off. So once we understand that better, maybe we also understand the entire transgenerational inheritance better. So for the future, I think, um, we need to understand better the evolution of imprinting and epigenetics, and that is, of course, much of what Professor Haig also deals with. Um, design the perfect human and animal studies to actually show transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. Consolidate the existing evidence better. And also, for some of the other marks that I have not talked about today, also, they, of course, also play into this question. Now, finally, what if epigenetics is inherited? We are probably <laughs> at the worst stage of our evolutionary development. So if all the bad trades that we have uh, been managed to include our lifestyle, etc., if all of this is in leaving marks in the epigenome, which is then transmitted to the next generation, is that actually a good idea, and where is this going to lead us? Well, maybe not everything is in the epigenome. <laughs> and I always, uh, I always tell people that while epigenetics is very fashionable to do and to research, the answer is not always in the epigenetics but it is oftentimes used as an explanation when we don't understand what's going on. <laughs> so I hope I was able to give you a little introduction into the world of epigenetics and why I'm here and what I'm interested in, and I thank you for your attention. <laughs>